We are live. Okay. So good evening, friends, and welcome to this thirty-third episode of All India Postgraduate Teaching Program, which was an initiative from new team of ARC AIS. This is a PG program with slight difference because it covers the uncovered aspects of other teaching programs like case presentations, journal clubs, OSCEs, and didactics rarely on topics which are not comprehensively available in textbook. So today we present the 33rd episode of this series, the ninth in the, of uh, ninth in the series of case presentation. Today we have two short cases. The first case would be presented by Dr. Aishwarya Patil, who is a final year resident at BJ Medical College and Sassoon General Hospital, Pune. And the second case will be presented by Dr. Devika Saxena, who is a final year PG resident at Sarojini Devi Eye Hospital and Usmania Medical College, Hyderabad. I'm thankful to both the mentors, Dr. Smita Maud, who is an associate professor at BJ Medical College for yeah. mentoring the um, Dr. Aishwarya and Dr. Uh, Raman, uh, Raman N. Inugandala, sir, who is a professor and chief department of pediatric ophthalmologist, establishment and neuro ophthalmology at Sarojini Devi Eye Hospital and Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. I'm really sincere, my sincere most thanks to both the mentors for preparing their both the mentees. My special thanks goes to Dr. Devi Aishwarya Das, who is a senior consultant, cornea, cataract and refractive surgeon at Dr. Agrawal Sai Hospital. She is a senior faculty, teaching faculty at Katak. Professor Dr. Navin Jai Kumar, honorary director at Darshan Eye Care, Chennai. Unfortunately, because of some emergency, he is not joining us. And we have the third examiner, who is going to be Dr. Paromita Datta, who is an associate professor at GNEC, Delhi. I'm thankful to all the all of them for being consenting and sparing their valuable time to be an examiner for this particular episode. Now, without much ado, I would request Dr. Aishwarya Patil to share her screen. In the absence of Dr. Navin Jai Kumar, I can request when Dr. Aishwarya Patil is presenting the case, I think Dr. Raman and uh, sir, you can join as a examiner. And remember, the children have to, the student have to present their case in 10 to 12 minutes. And 20 minutes will be the discussion for each case. In event, if you feel the examiners feel that they have to interrupt the while presenting, well, you can. But the cumulative time of presentation, the students, you should remember, is 12 minutes. And in, in event, if the examiners ask you during the course of your presentation, that would be naturally taken uh, considered. So, Dr. Uh, Aishwarya, are you ready? Please share yes. your screen. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank AIOS for giving us this opportunity and my mentor, Dr. Smita, ma'am, for guiding me through this. Uh, so my case presentation. A 74-year-old male presented to ophthalmology OPD with chief complaints of drooping of eyelids in both the eyes since last two years. Patient also complained of gradual painless, progressive diminution of vision in left eye since last two years. Patient was apparently all right two years back when he noticed gradual drooping of eyelids in both the eyes. Diminution of in left eye, which was gradually in onset, painless and progressive in nature. There is history of right eye cataract surgery four years back. No history of ocular trauma. Patient has no history of diplopia. No history of change in drooping of the eyelids during the day. Mm, patient has a history of spectacle use. Patient has been using crushed glasses since last two years. Patient is a known case of diabetes and hypertension since last seven years and is on the treatment for seeing. The personal history is within normal limit. Patient has no history of fatigue. Uh, there is no significant family history. General examination was within, uh, GC was fair, was within normal limit. Systemic examination uh, of CVS, CNS, RS and per abdo was uh, not significant. Uh, patient showed no sign of muscle weakness. On inspection, the facial symmetry was maintained. Head posture was normal. Ocular position was normal. Both sides brows were elevated and symmetry was maintained. Both eye extraocular movements were full, free, and painless in all cases. Uh, no lag of thalamus could be uh, seen. Uh, 
uh, on right eye examination, the uncorrected visual acuity was counting finger five meter. Best corrected visual acuity was six by thirty six. Intraocular pressure taken on non-contact tonometer was thirteen point two millimeters of mercury. Uh, lead examination showed ptosis and blepharocalasis. The rest of the anterior seg uh, segment examination was within normal limit. The lens status was pseudo uh, patient had PCO. Fundus was within normal limit. The left eye uh, examination showed visual uncorrected visual acuity counting finger four minutes. Base cor best corrected visual acuity six by sixty. Intraocular pressure taken on non-contact tonometer, 14.3 millimeters of mercury. Uh, lead examination showed ptosis and blepharocalasis. Rest of the anterior segment examination was within normal limit, with the lens status being nucleus sclerosis grade 2. Fundus was within normal limit. So what is the type of uh, I... RTL? Sorry, sir? Excuse me, what is that IPL? Uh, go back to the slide. Yes, sir. Slide. Uh, you wrote here, no, IP normal size RTL, normal size RTL. What is that? Yes, sir. The uh, iris and pupil, iris pupil examination uh, showed the pupil size was normal and pupil was reacting to light in both eyes. Okay. Right. Yeah, you can proceed. Uh, right eye dosis evaluation showed MRD 1 minus 1 millimeter, mm -hmm. MRD 2, 6 millimeter. Uh, palpebral fissure height 5 mm, LPS action was 4 mm, mm, ALH was 3 cm, uh, margin crease distance was 8 mm, mm -hmm. TPS was 8 mm, lead lag was absent, frontalis over action was present, there was no improvement on ice pack test or no change in aquatic test, lead crease was present and was elevated, jaw winking phenomenon was absent. Shermer test value was 70. Corneal sensations were present and Bell's phenomenon was good. Left eye examination showed MRD 1 minus 2 millimeter, MRD 2 6 millimeter, palpebral fissure height 4 millimeter, LPS action was 3 millimeter, ALH was 3 centimeter, MCD was 10 millimeter, TPS 6 millimeter, lead lag was absent with frontalis overaction present. Ice pack test and putty test showed no improvement. But lead crease was uh, present. Instead of uh, putting abbreviations, no, you can expand what is ALS and the MCD and TPS. Yes, sir. MCD is margin crease distance and TPS is tarsal plate show. written there, no. What is yes. ALS? Uh, anterior lamellar height, sir. Uh, that's what you have, you have to expand that. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. What is the TPS? Tarsal plate show, sir. Okay, okay. Can I uh, proceed? Yeah, yeah, right, proceed. The job thinking phenomena were absent, Sherma test value being 19, corneal sensations were present, and Bell's phenomenon was good. Okay. This is the clinical photograph of the patient. Mm. The patient was using crutch glasses, which can be seen in the right sided picture. Yeah. So, my provisional diagnosis is. Right eye acquired aponeurotic ptosis with pseudopakia and left eye acquired aponeurotic ptosis with nuclear sclerosis grade 2. But that's all your presentation? Yes, sir. This age group, no? Uh, 75 year old uh, male patient. Can you summarize yes. the case history briefly? Uh, so, my patient, 75 year old male, came mm -hmm. with the complaints of both eyes drooping of the eyelids. With okay. the uh, and is drooping or uh, one after the other, how it started? I mean, any gap is there between the two eyes? Uh, no, sir. There was no uh, variation in the drooping of eyelids in both the eyes, and it was progressing gradually over the two years. Okay. Uh, so the patient with uh, the patient had. No systemic illness with the uh, severe ptosis and blepharocalysis in both eyes, with right eye pseudophakia and left eye nucleus sclerosis grade 2. My provisional diagnosis being both are acquired upon neurotic ptosis. Yeah, okay. Apart from with this, good uh, Bell's phenomenon and poor LP yeah, section. Yeah, yeah. Bell's phenomenon is good. But apart from this, what are the other uh, differential diagnoses uh, you think about? 
this is a, this these are your preliminary diagnosis no but yes, the you have to think about no what are the differential diagnosis uh, sir i have a differential diagnosis of it can be a myasthenia gravis case okay this mm. extreme age group uh sorry sir myasthenia this is an extreme age no 75 year old male so yes, any, sir. Other, uh, any other differentials okay myasthenia one thing ocular myasthenia then uh ocular myopathies or uh, chronic progressive or uh, op chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia ah, yes chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia yeah. then so there is a bilateral ptosis no so any other uh, neurological neuroophthalmic conditions uh, you have to keep in mind this age group so because there is bilaterality whenever there is a bilateral uh, always you have to think about all other uh, differentials particularly this is extreme age group no so one by one uh, each differentials no so what is you wrote about blepharocalysis no yes sir yeah blepharocalysis can it itself produce uh, uh, ptosis in this age group in this extreme age yes group? sir blepharocalysis can present ptosis in this age group yeah uh, but the patient has poor lps action too okay and the lead crease is elevated so okay. uh, that is why my diagnosis goes more towards upon neurotic ptosis rather than blepharocalysis okay uh, first we have to think about what are the acquired causes of ptosis and particularly in this extreme age group isn't it so then uh, um, how do you exclude the chronic ptosis of external ophthalmic region Per se. The patient had uh, patient had no systemic uh, any systemic uh, finding. Patient was not presenting with. Also, patient had no history of. Most of the times, uh, in chronic progress of external ophthalmic region, uh, what age group it starts? Sir, usually young age group it starts in. Yeah, usually young age group, but in extreme age groups also it can present. So generally, it is it started with. Uh, bilateral na yes uh, sir yeah started in uh, both eyes okay uh, and uh, it is a slowly progressive okay it's a slowly progressive uh, ophthalmoplegia uh, so was there any ophthalmoplegia uh, uh, yeah uh, of course there is no ophthalmoplegia no as per no, your no. Uh, presentation uh, and sir was hinting at another cause in elderly with uh, generally atherosclerosis present, yeah. would there be an ischemic etiology? So Something that is causing a bilateral ptosis? Uh, Think of the nerve supply. Ischemic third cranial nerve palsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah but in which area that is important? So in the, the Edinger Westphal nucleus. Yeah. Edinger Westphal is not for uh, extraocular muscles. There's something called Daroff rules. Have you heard of that? Daroff rules? Uh, no, no. Fundus is within normal limits, no? In your case? Yes, sir. Fundus is normal, no? Yes, sir. So, do you know about uh, the subnuclei of the third nerve? Mm -hmm. See, generally, it's, uh, it started bilaterally, no? So whenever uh, there is bilateral ptosis, uh, and started almost like uh, in a the same uh, in a single episode, like within a small gap, no. So we have to think about uh, the neurogenic causes, particularly the central causes. So the bilateral ptosis, it could be a the central uh, nuclear uh, lesion, okay, in the midbrain. So like midbrain ptosis. So in this case, what are the investigations we are going to order for? Uh, sir, all the uh, routine blood investigations will get routine done. Means, to please. the CBC, LFT, RFT, platelet count. Okay. Uh, I also like to check the patient, even if the ice pack test and fatigue test is negative. Yeah, negative no? I also mm -hmm. like to check the patient for myasthenia, yeah, uh, yeah. testing the anti um, Anticholinesterase, uh, acetylcholine receptor antibodies, 
and hydroponium test i like to do uh, any other systemic examination um, i like to do in this patient okay then uh, any neurological investigations like uh, neuroimaging why don't why don't you consider to uh, you know order for neuroimaging because there is bilateral bilateral dosis no this unilateral okay uh, we can wait but whenever there is bilateral dosis as madam suggestion no? the ischemic pathology is one thing but uh, Sir, iris pupil was both a normal size reacting to light. The extraocular muscles were normal. So mm -hmm. I was uh, not looking for any neurological cause in so this What case. type of uh, pupillary responses are seen in, in the supranuclear uh, lesions or the midbrain or nuclear pathologies? Sir, midriasis will be there. Yeah. Midriasis will be there, and then light near dissociation along with bilateral ptosis. Okay, so midbrain ptosis has to be ruled out. So that is on that possibility because there is a bilateral. Okay. Yes, sir. And then. Uh, Any other possibility like supranuclear uh, progressive palsy, like Parkinson's? Can it produce Parkinson's process? Mm -hmm. Progressive nuclear. But it starts with uh, other. Sir, sir again, Parkinson's case would have some uh, other. Rigidity, the stooping posture, oh, slow. The systemic examination. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, in the systemic examination. So the ocular ocular presentation won't be the first presentation in such case. Yeah. So the less suspected. Like uh, we have to inquire about whether the patient has any dysarthria or dysphagia, and then the reading difficulties. Okay. Yes, sir. And then uh, you know, eyelid uh, sometimes motor apraxia. So those difficulties are there. So when we are examining the, this sort of cases, then we yes. have to inquire about uh, those aspects. We have to look at. Yes. Okay. So finally, uh, how do you manage this? Question, sir. Um... Sir, uh, for this patient, um, the patient was not willing for the surgery. So the previous uh, consultant has prescribed him crutch glasses and he's still comfortable with the crutch glasses. But I'll try to counsel the patient for surgeries. In this case, uh, even if uh, even if in the aponeurotic cases, the levator resection is the preferred surgery. But as the patient has both, the both, both LPS are poor. So I, I would like to go for the sling surgery in this case. Yeah, LPS action is poor. No? So, any a patient is on any uh, long term usage of drugs, any topical uh, steroids or anything? Uh, uh, the crutch glasses we don't uh, we don't advise for a long term use crutch glasses sir, because in this patient, no, is there any history of usage of uh, any drugs? Uh, yes, he has been taking lubricating drops as he has been using crutch glasses. Not the steroid drops. No, sir. Then what could be the what are the other causes they can contribute for aponeurotic ptosis? Aponeurotic uh, ptosis can be uh, involutional. It can be traumatic. Uh, it can be following a surgery. Yeah. Uh, any cataract surgery, do you think cataract surgery has contributed for the, this patient developing uh, process? Usually, he underwent cataract surgery four years back, no? As per your history. But, sir, in this case, we have a bilateral ptosis. If mm -hmm. it would have been following the cataract surgery, patient would have presented with only right eye ptosis. Yeah. Only right eye underwent surgery. Yes, Not sir. The left left eye is pending. 
So how do you explain the poor LPS action? Generally, in aponeurotic ptosis, it's only the lid crease that is high. Yes, ma'am. The patient has poor LPS action. That is why I uh, want to evaluate for the other causes too. Even if the MG is not the, uh, M, uh, even if the myasthenia gravis um, tests which we have been conducted are not positive, still I'd like to uh, evaluate for it as the LPS action is usually good in the aponeurotic cases in any acquired case. And there were, uh, and was there any abnormal head posture? No, ma'am. There was no abnormality in the head but, posture. Generally, you know, he, he has a bilateral ptosis, no? Chin left. So, yes, he should have, he should adopt, uh, you know, the, what type of but, uh, compulsory head posture he will have? Chin left he'll have, sir. But he is using crutch glasses. That's why he didn't uh, come up with the chin lift. When the glasses were prescribed? Uh, recently or... Uh, since no, the... sir. He has been using it for last two years. Yeah. And in addition to his lid condition, would you like to rehabilitate him visually? Like 6 by 36 vision is not adequate in any way. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to do his yak pisiotomy in the right eye and left eye. We'd like to uh, consult the uh, advise the patient for cataract surgery. So, anything you know, in case uh, CPO is one thing, uh, you have to strongly think about it because. Very slowly, uh, it is uh, progressive actually. It takes very long time uh, in uh, many cases uh, to develop the ophthalmic region. So that also have to be kept in mind, uh, particularly in this case. I've seen many cases in the extreme age group uh, presenting with CPO with bilateral entosis with similar presentation. But slowly they come out with uh, either uh, exodeviation or exodeviation. Uh, and then, uh, then starts with the double vision. Those issues will be there. Uh, okay, that also we have to keep in mind. And in many cases, uh, you know, they don't show the typical uh, fundus pictures. Like, what is a common uh, fundus uh, picture seen with uh, CPO? Do you know the associations? CPO, what are the other associations it has along with the, this presentation? Generally, many cases. Mm -hmm. no? You know, you have to be careful about uh, uh, cardiac uh, conduction defects. Okay. So, yes. generally, we have to refer the patient to the cardiologist for the evaluation of the cardiac condition and the, particularly the conduction defects. Okay. And the other thing is uh, uh, the fundus examination has to be done. And uh, they'll, uh, some of them, they present with uh, uh, salt and pepper appearance of the fundus. Okay. And uh, some of them, they will have the other associated uh, muscular dystrophies. Okay. So, the yes, uh, evaluation part, uh, uh, carefully you have to uh, do that. Okay. Any respiratory embarrassment or uh, uh, respiratory difficulty or any dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, they are usually associated. Right. And, uh, yes, sir. We used to do the I strongly feel uh, this case, uh, uh, we should go for a new revision, definitely. Yes, the definitely. Says, uh, and then uh, the most of the cortic, uh, uh, the bilateral doses, no? uh, uh, we, have to, we have to do new revision. How, what uh, type of new revision we will order for? I show them. Yes. Sir, uh, city brain plus orbit. No, no, no. I like no, to get done. City no. brain, we don't accept. City brain is not all sufficient. See, always it is better we order for the brain with contrast enhancement until unless there is a contraindication for contrast uh, usage. Okay, I mean, like if the patient has any compromised uh, kidney conditions like uh, CKD and all that, then we don't. Uh, Ask for the contrast enhancement. Otherwise, we should ask for contrast enhancement with MRI and uh, particularly the localization around the 
around the membrane. So we have to order the to tell the radiologist. We must speak to the radiologist beforehand, and uh, we should tell. That is the uh, one thing about uh, to remember about this because in this extreme age group, no, sometimes you know the uh, space occupying lesions, sometimes the deposits, secondaries, they can come and dock by uh, that age. No, okay, wait for a minute. Yes, sir. And you said pupils are normal. Am I right? Pupils normal, normal reacting. Okay. Yes, sir. Another suggestion would be to ask the patient to get old photographs. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so sir. there you can compare, you can have an idea of the onset of the process. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, we know at the time of onset of process. Sometimes, you know, in early stages of uh, appearance of process, patient might have uh, uh, continued with that, ignoring that. And uh, after once it has become severe, now he has the difficulty with uh, no, then now we as approach that possibility is also there. Sir, question, sir? Yeah, so you ready? Ask, you want to ask anything more? No, no, I am not a right person. I am from <laughs> Retina. So I was just also learning like uh, other people. Yeah, actually, what? you know, this uh, yeah, tosis person uh, knows the turn of palsy. <laughs> I know. So now we will move on to that particular thing. So thank you, Aishwara. You did it well. Yes, you did. Fact, you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Had I been in your place, probably I might not have answered even the one-fourth of the questions which you could answer so confidently. I'm so proud of you. Seriously, this generation yeah. is well-read and better-read than our generation. <laughs> and for me, I think uh, 93, I finished my MS. So it's more than 30 years I'm away from Tosi, so it's difficult for me to <laughs> comprehend even now. Yeah, actually, but... the aqua part, I too, I too don't do. Uh, Correct. Oh, yeah, at least the teaching, uh, obviously, more... you know, we get ophthalmology studies, but there is some mm -hmm. overlap, no? So, frequently we'll be seeing the cases and then referring to the aquaplastic surgeon. Correct. So, thank you, Dr. Uh, Aishwarya. Now, uh, can I request Dr. Devika to go ahead with her presentation and a short case on third nerve palsy? I and now, hope... is Dr. Raman. So, I think now Dr. Smita can join us in that uh, as an examiner. Okay? Please. Yes, sure, sir. Thank you. Good evening to one and all. Is my screen visible? Yes, Devika, you can go ahead. Am I... okay. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Good evening to one and all. I am Dr. Devika Saxena and my mentor is Dr. Y. Raman. A 43-year-old male uh, hailing from Ghatkesar, Hyderabad, a goldsmith previously by occupation, now, as a, uh, now working as a daily wage laborer, presented to the OPD with complaints of limitation of movement in the right eye since 20 years. These are the old photographs of the patient. To see whether the limitation was there, uh, since childhood or when did it come? So there was no limitation on these photographs as seen. History of presenting illness. The patient was apparently asymptomatic when in 2004, that is 20 years back, he under the influence of alcohol fell while riding the bike, lost his consciousness and was then admitted in a private hospital for the same for about two months. He was unconscious for nearly one and a half months. On gaining consciousness, he noticed his right eye deviation for which he asked the doctors and was informed by the doctors that it may gradually improve and recover. He also had uh, right-sided weakness, which gradually recovered by two years. There's a history of blood transfusion, details not known in that episode, but the patient has no previous hospital records with him now. Right eye outward deviation that started following trauma, patient is unable to explain whether it has got better or worse with time. There is no complaint of double vision, no pain or headache, no complaint of loss of vision, no uh, not associated with any diurnal variation. He was a goldsmith, but could not carry on his work following the accident because of the right eye outward deviation. And he's also unmarried because of the stigma that was associated with the squint. There's no loss of smell, no difficulty in swallowing and chewing food, no loss of taste sensation, no loss of hearing, no difficulty in shrugging of shoulders or toning his neck to the sides, and no complaint of drooling of saliva. Past history... I would like to just uh, interrupt you here. There was no diplopia. No diplopia, ma'am. Okay. There is no diplopia. 
past history uh, there is no comorbidity uh, the importance of negative history whatever you have asked okay ma'am yes ma'am uh, there is no complaint of double vision which i have basically asked because of the squint that has appeared and it's an acquired squint and late onset squint so usually it is associated with diplo uh, diplopia pain or headache sometimes uh, if patient has a uh, any palsy associated there might be uh, periorbital pain that might be there and diurnal variation i have asked for uh, to know because whether the, devi uh, the deviation and the uh, drooping of the lid that he had was it associated with any diurnal variation to come to a diagnosis to rule out myasthenia gravis especially and go, uh, also all there is no loss of smell that is for the first cranial nerve no difficulty in swallowing and chewing of food is there there's no taste sensation for anterior two third of the tongue which is for the sensory part of the facial nerve no loss of hearing to rule out the eighth nerve no difficulty in shrugging of shoulders or turning his neck is for the 11th and the 12th nerve and no ruling of saliva for the motor component of the facial nerve okay. treatment history there has uh, uh, no history of any ophthalmological surgery or consultation previously in the past 20 years he's not on any medication currently birth history is insignificant and family history is also insignificant since it's an acquired cause Patient is a known alcoholic and smoker, drinks whiskey 90 ml one to two times per week, has 0.2 packets of cigarettes, mixed diet, appetite is normal, bowel and bladder movements are regular, sleep is adequate, he's unmarried, educated with class 12th. On examination, patient is conscious, cooperative, coherent, well-oriented to time, place and person, moderately built and nourished, gait appears normal, vitals are within normal limits. This is a video of the patient. Systemic examination. Central nervous system, higher mental functions uh, are normal, low sensory and motor deficit. Cranial nerve examination I have described later on. Other systemic examination is within normal limits. Vision, uncorrected uh, uh, visual equity 6 by 24 in both eyes. With pinhole, it improves to 6 by 6 partial. And after retinoscopy, the patient improves in right eye with minus 2 uh, diopters spherical to 6 by 6 partial. And left eye, uh, it improves with minus 3 diopters 6 by 6 partial with the near vision. Orthoptic evaluation. The patient has no anomalous head posture. Right nasolabial fold is indistinct, is indistinct and slight deviation of the mouth to the left is there. Ocular symmetry is lost due to ptosis and outward deviation of the right eye. On Hirschberg corneal reflex test, in the right eye, there is more than 45 degrees of exotropia and 10 degrees of hypotropia. Left eye is central. On cover test, I will be demonstrating the video as well. On covering the left eye, the right eye moves in and up to take fixation. And the undercover eye moves up and out. There is no movement uh, of the uh, left eye on covering the right eye. On uncover test, on uncovering the left eye, right eye moves out and down with good redressal movement C. On alternate cover test, as we can see, right eye moves up and into take fixation and left eye moves down and into take fixation alternatively. The ptosis of the right eye also disappears when the patient is uh, trying to fixate, indicating that there is pseudocytosis in the right eye. Orthoptic evaluation continued. Prism bar cover test done in the primary gaze. The primary deviation showed 90 prism diopters basin and 20 prism diopters base up. Secondary deviation uh, was more than 19 prism diopters basin, 40 prism diopters base up, showing that secondary deviation is more than primary deviation. This is the video of the prism bar cover test. Since the deviation is more than uh, on Hirschberg corneal reflex test was more than 45 degrees and on prism bar more than 90 degrees, we have split the prism between two eyes as we have a prism of not more than 50 uh, prism diopters with us. We can see that since it's an exotropia, we're placing the prism uh, with the base in as the apex is towards the uh, angular side of deviation. Primsky test was also done for the further planning and the management of the surgery. Extraocular movements. This is a video of the extraocular movements. There is limitation uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, on liver elevation, liver version, liver, uh, liver depression, also on direct elevation, direct depression, dextro elevation, and dextro depression. Aberrant regeneration is seen. On adduction, the palpebral fissure height increases. As we can see in this video, that on adduction, the palpebral fissure height is increasing. On forced duction test, we can see that there is positive forced duction test. 
for the lateral rectus. Sensory evaluation, only the star is seen on Lang's chart too. And for Worthford dot test, for both near and far, only three green dots are visible. This is due to the fact that the patient, uh, since there is exodeviation, which is more than 90 present diopters, falls which is not falling in the field of vision. Cranial nerve examination. Uh, second nerve is near normal. Uh, seventh uh, nerve has near total recovery. And third nerve is the one which is majorly affected. On optic nerve evaluation, pupils were uh, normal size and reacting to light, but color vision was affected. He could only read 5 by 17 plates on the Ishiara charts. And brightness, the patient could perceive brightness more in the left eye than compared to the right eye. Confrontation was normal. To rule out the other um, cranial nerves, this is a test which we do to demonstrate the uh, intactness of the fourth nerve, that is to show the superior oblique action. Since the eye cannot adduct, we have to do it in the abducted position. And when we move, make the patient move from down gaze to up gaze, we can see the eye interrupting. I will uh, play the video again once. Anterior segment, uh, right eye had ptosis. Otherwise, the anterior segment was within normal limits. Both eyes, the fundus is within normal limits. The pupils are also uh, normal in shape, size, and reacting to light. This is the ptosis evaluation. And on ptosis, basically, we've done it to see for the aberrant regeneration where the palpebral fissure height on adduction is improving by 7 millimeters. I summarize my case, a 43-year-old male with limitations of movement in right eye since 20 years following a road traffic accident and no known comorbidities, a known alcoholic and smoker with right eye exotropia uh, of 45 degrees and 10 degrees hypertropia. On cover test, on covering the left eye, uh, the right eye moves in and the undercover uh, up and in and the undercover left eye moves up and out. On a prism bar cover test, it showed that secondary deviation is more than primary deviation. There is limitation of movements of the right eye seen in all cases except dextroversion. The eye appears to be fixed in down and out position with ptosis and no pupillary involvement. Uh, aberrant regeneration is seen in, uh, with increase in palpebral fissure height on attempted adduction with right eye and positive force adduction test for right eye lateral rectus. All cranial nerves are normal except right eye cranial nerve palsy, which we can see with the uh, down and out position and almost near total recovery of the seventh uh, cranial nerve and the second cranial nerve. Both eyes, best corrected visual acuity is 6 by 6 partial and fundus is within normal limits. My differential diagnosis is a traumatic, that is an acquired third cranial nerve palsy, pupillary sparing with signs of aberrant regeneration, which is an inverse to one side. Other differentials include an acquired monoocular elevation deficit, advanced retraction type 2, fracture of the lateral wall of the orbit, myasthenia gravis, and thyroid disease. But my provisional diagnosis is a long standing acquired right eye traumatic third cranial nerve pupillary sparing palsy with aberrant, regen uh, aberrant regeneration, uh, sorry for the typing error, and in, uh, which is the inverse to one side. On management, we had done the routine investigations, the, the pressures were done, and surgically, yeah. since there was... Uh, oh, I'll stop here because I think our clinical presentation stops here. So, yes, I yeah. so I thought of asking you just a few questions, couple of questions. I am not a screen or a neurology specialist. Uh, can you explain why two questions? Why uh, why the patient uh, uh, does not have a diplopia? One and the second one is uh, what is the cause uh, for his color vision being subnormal in the right eye? Yes, ma'am. You are saying that it is subnormal. Would you like to again recheck for some other sign? Yeah. Ma'am, uh, first for diplopia, the patient does not have uh, diplopia because, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, a he has a bit of ptosis and the uh, uh, he the vision is good in the other eye, but there is so much amount of exotropia so that the image does is falling out of fields, ma'am. So there is no diplopia present, ma'am, even on birth for dot test, ma'am. The patient is not complaining of diplopia at all. Okay, so uh, long standing. It's a huge deviation, now, madam. So it's what happens is that false image. Goes out of the field of vision. Out of the field. So the patient is enjoying with the uniocular vision that is with the left eye. Yeah, that is one point. The second point is uh, like uh, he was uh, hospitalized and he was uh, not conscious for about two months, right? So yes, when, one and up, yes. Uh, when it was in the initial phases, do you think he would have taken up any abnormal head posture to compensate for the diplopia then, or even then he didn't have it? Ma'am, uh, I. 
if uh, the deviation would have been such a uh, huge deviation uh, there wouldn't have been a complaint of diplopia uh, maybe initially because of the ptosis there might have been a slight amount of chin elevation which we do not know of now because he is not telling of anything and in, uh, about the subnormal color vision in the right eye and when you are having a subnormal color vision would you like to recheck for something else ma'am for the pupillary reaction or the, uh, the subnormal color vision yes ma'am we thought that the pupil might also be involved but we feel that the pupil has recovered as of now and the color vision is not affected even the fields appear to be normal but color vision is decreased so we are thinking that maybe the uh, second cranial nerve is almost near total recovered but not completely i don't know if anything more more than the pupillary reaction or the confrontation test or feels uh, if we send for a uh, Humphrey's visual field, anything else more than that. Yeah. We so wanted to send it for fields, ma'am, but it was not affordable for that. No, oh, that is there for academic purposes. You can do it, but I, I want to just know what you would like to investigate. I mean, how you would proceed about this kid. That's all. Okay. Yes. And, and can you show me that gate of his, that video that showed the gate? Um, yes, ma'am, I will show you. Okay. Thank you. So did he have any other kind of aberrant regeneration? Was it only uh, on adduction? No. Yes, ma'am. There are no other signs of aberrant regeneration or where uh, either the, uh, the lid was elevating on down gaze or there was a retraction of uh, mild. Um, there hasn't been any sign or any other than this, ma'am. Or maybe like the... Uh, convergence or anything, ma'am. Nothing of that sort is there. No, no, Devika, Devika, you tell me what are the other signs of aberrant regeneration? You just expand, no? What are the aberrant uh, regenerations? Following okay. trauma, what are the causes? What are the uh, etiological factors producing thorough palsy can present with aberrant regeneration? Aberrant regeneration itself, sir, if uh, long-standing uh, third nerve palsies on uh, on the road to recovery may have an aberrant regeneration where an involuntary uh, action might occur when trying to attempt an voluntary reaction is what is basically an aberrant regeneration, also called as synchysis or we can call it as an oculomotor misdirection. Basically, there could be uh, one of them that I have uh, showed here is inverse ones where on adduction, uh, there is uh, the lid elevates, but this might also be there on down gaze, which is called a pseudo one graph sign. And uh, there might also be a uh, uh, retraction of the globe, which might be seen on vertical movements or up uh, or down, or sometimes there can be a pseudo argyral, uh, argyral Robertson. Pseudo argyral Robertson people. So that is. See what happens now because in aberrant regeneration, the misdirected uh, regenerating uh, fibers now, which are intended to reach, innervate the medial lectus muscle, rather they go to the sphincter pupillae. Okay. Whenever we attempt to uh, uh, the patient uh, do the accommodation, then we will see the uh, pupil is reacting. But for light, there is no reaction because whenever it is in the, with the pupillary involvement whenever the pupillary involvement for the direct light request it is not there but for the attempted accommodation yes the pupil response so that is pseudo organ rubber some people and another one is whenever there is a misdirection is happening sometimes the fibers which are intended to innervate the medial lectus there is a super rectus or sometimes they uh, misfire to the inferior rectus so on attempted adduction Sometimes eyeball it shoots up or it, it shoots down. Sometimes the fibers which are intended to uh, innervate the superactors, rather they innervate the medial lectus. In that case, what will happen? On attempted adduction, uh, the eyeball will go up. So like that, there are various uh, uh, types of uh, aberrant regeneration. And it is uh, typically seen with uh, uh, the compressive pathologies, which are responsible for the Turner palsy and other thing is a traumatic Turner oh. palsy, okay, long-standing Turner palsy, and then the congenital uh, Turner uh, 
uh, palsy and then the childhood trauma palsy. So all these cases, uh, whenever there are aberrant regenerations, yes, we need to be very careful and especially we need to uh, exclude the possibility of the compressive pathology. Okay. So, Devika, why, why does uh, aberrant regeneration occur only in compressive and traumatic uh, etiologies? The mechanism. Ma Ma if it's an ischemic cause, uh, usually if it's an uh, ischemic cause, it would usually be because of the decrease in supply and which we generally uh, um, attribute to diabetes or hypertension and any of those or atherosclerosis. Oh. Devika, those I mean, gradually, why does it occur? Why does it, uh, why aberrant regeneration? Devika. Devika, you it's stop. Not no, ischemic, but occurs in uh, compressive and traumatic causes. The Ma mechanism. There are three types of uh, nerve damages, uh, neuroparaxia, axonotemesis, and neurotemesis. So when there is complete disruption of the endoneurium as well, usually, of the nerve, is when damage is there and when the nerve is recovering, yeah, is yeah. when there are chances That's about. right. That's right. That's the answer yeah. we're looking for. Yeah, that is the correct answer. So it happens only with the traumatic and compressive. And it never happens with the ischemic pathology. Remember that thing. No, no ischemic cause can produce signs of aberrant regeneration. Okay. And then what is the significance of pupillary involvement? What is pupillary sparing? And what is uh, uh, pupillary involving uh, thorner palsy? What is the significance? Or what is the what is the surgical cause? What is a medical cause? So, if it's a pupillary involving uh, lesion, it is usually considered as a surgical cause. Or initially, only uh, sometimes we have to be as careful as only where cranial third cranial nerve might uh, palsy might only present as an initial pupillary involvement and with no other extraocular movement involvement. Any of these causes, and especially in people less than fifty years, we must always send for a neuroimaging because we need to find especially an aneurysm which is at the junction of the posterior communicating artery and the internal carotid artery is the most common cause. Mechanism. So, Tell us the mechanism yes. of why people is involved in surgical causes and not in medical causes. Yes, ma'am. So as we see the optic nerve fiber that is there, so in the nerve, on the in inner aspect, you have a vasa vasorum. Now this vasa vasorum is the one supplying uh, blood. So in the ischemic causes, it is uh, the pupil is spared because only the vasa vasorum is affecting and the pupillary fibers which are on the superior medial aspect are not getting affected. But when it's a compressive lesion, if it's a hematoma or a aneurysm which is bled, the superior medial fibers which are there of the pupil will also get compressed and that is how the pupil will also get involved in surgical causes and not in but medical or ischemic causes. Yeah, they are superficially located, isn't it? Superior medial aspect and pupillary motor fibers are situated superficially and uh, the pial vessels uh, uh, they supply the uh, you know the blood supply is from the pial vessels to okay. the pupillary motor fibers so easily these superficially located uh, uh, fibers you know they get compressed uh, uh, with the compressive pathology right but there are exceptions you know 20 percent of cases even ischemic causes uh, can also uh, involve the uh, pupil so that happens whenever there is a pial vessel undergoes the ischemia, then they can too present with the pupillary involvement. Okay. It is never infallible. Devika, how will you differentiate this case from Duan's retraction syndrome? Ma'am, uh, if it had to be a Duan's retraction syndrome, it would have been an uh, the child. It would usually be a child. It's basically a congenital thing. Plus, uh, the Deviation is not such a big deviation in Duvan's retraction syndrome, ma'am. That is one of the major things. So it's normally, not... what is the amount of the deviation you see in Duvan's retraction syndrome? So 10 to 20. No, no, no. Around 30. 30, 30, 30 maximum. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. 30. Okay. So here it is almost uh, close to yeah. 95, isn't it? So and, uh, that too, it appeared only after that incident, you know, after that road traffic accident. Even his pictures, ma'am, that we've seen previously do not show us of any sign where there was um, any of the uh, 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 exodeviation my, or an exodeviation or any now of that. We look at all the old photographs, isn't it? Yes. So if there had been no uh, history of trauma, how would you investigate a patient of an acquired turn of that scene? If there would have been no history of trauma, ma'am, and if uh, you, uh, depending on whether uh, the age of the patient also, and if it's uh, it's less than 50 years and there is pupillary involvement, if I assess that there is pupillary involvement, I would still send in for a non-contrast, uh, sorry, contrast-enhanced contrast. uh, 
imaging of the brain and the orbit mri i will still send in for one but if it's a 50 year old above patient and presenting and has a history of diabetes hypertension or a coronary artery disease uh, where pupil is not involved then uh, i would more uh, think in lines on the ischemic causes or the medical causes try to look at the blood sugars send in for an rba send for the uh, fasting and the uh, postprandial blood sugars and c for the blood pressure would send for a lipid profile so i would more go in terms of that cause but if that cause is also not and we would wait and wait and watch for the patient if that is also not responding in 3 to 6 months or something we would again go and resort back to neuroimaging now no, madam is asking about the particularly about this case see in this case no we have not done the neuroimaging is it we have not so, done what madam is insisting Ma'am, we've not done neuroimaging for the sole reason Aye. that uh, in yeah. first when he presented to us, we asked him whether you have any old records. To which he said that he has not got any old records because he was very upset with the episode and he's destroyed all of them. So we could have sent, but we did not send him in this case because there actually there was no pupillary involvement. And since it's an acquired cause where he is giving a strong history of trauma, which is there twenty years back, so we did not uh, send in for a neuroimaging as it was not required. in this long standing case ma'am yeah one thing no see since then no there are no additional uh, neurological deficits uh, you yes. know added to this condition isn't it so that is yes. the main reason so <clears throat> and of course when he was hospitalized neuroimaging was done but all the records and the films pictures everything you know missing he is not having anything but since it is a stable condition for last so many years We thought it is not necessary. Why did you look for that gate, Devika? You have taken so, the video, no? The gate. Yes, so I right? looked for the gate initially. That was my first reaction when the patient came and he had ptosis. Sir. So I thought maybe uh, ptosis is there, and me though the other eye was normal, and I wanted to see if uh, there is any gate abnormality or is there no, any. No, 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 no. That is not that. See, any case of uh, cranial no palsy. You know, sometimes there may be associated, uh, particularly a crushed hemiplegia could be there, isn't it? So you have to you have to verify. Once the patient is coming a, a neuroanatomic condition, you have to do the systemic evaluation as well. And the gait is part of your uh, general examination and CNS examination. Okay. Yes. So even if there's a Weber syndrome or anything. Yeah. Weber syndrome. Crushed hemiplegia. Uh, yes. Okay. For contralateral hemiplegia. Yes. Yeah. Devika, my last question to you. Yes, ma'am. Just few common, uh, common uh, clinic tests, clinical tests to differentiate a pupillary involving third lobe palsy and a coexistent third lobe and a second lobe palsy. Common tests. Similar. Uh, to dis distinguish a pupillary involving with a uh, coexisting se second lobe. Yeah. Ma'am, if it's a pupillary involving third nerve palsy, it is basically the afferent efferent pathway which is involved. So, if the efferent pathway is just, just tell me some simple test. Uh, so, we would take a pupil involving third nerve palsy and a coexisting second and third nerve palsy. Why am I asking you? Because it was already there in your presentation. Are you reading, ma'am? The first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. which I you would like to look at. That is important. See, you know, in there is an efferent. Uh, Involvement is there, for example. So how is the direct? Uh, I will look at the other eye, sir. The the other the. Transversal reflex. For the left eye, sir. Yeah. So what is it called? The consensual light reflex, ma'am. Pupillary light reflex. That is one. Some other test. Um, uh, it was already there in your presentation. So I just. Wanted to know whether you are applying it when you are analyzing a case. Yes, because here you are preparing. You are already prepared for a case. Yes, but the exam will be given the same case scenario, or maybe with a slight twist. So you must be the color, like color, color, color vision and the uh, yes. uh, and the brightness uh, testing we will do for just to check for the second nerve involvement yes and concentration test at least on the in the opd basis we can do it uh, also as well now you are right <laughs> good and also your near vision yes, yes. near vision also yeah yes
So anything regarding the management part, uh, Dr. Prashna, can we ask a few questions? Oh, not you are asking your own person. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All people, you know, they'll be knowing about uh, how to manage because we want to show the result in this case because it is a 20-year-old, more than 20-year-old history of uh, deviation and uh, we attempted this as uh, show the um, uh, treatment part. Huh? Yes. I want to add a few more points, two, three points here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is so the... the management that we had planned for the patient since the patient had an aberrant regeneration and whenever there's an aberrant regeneration considering that we have to uh, we have to plan our management and just not on the basis of the cranial nerve palsy so here we planned uh, to uh, operate on the left eye which was the unaffected eye based on the concept of fixation duress and so uh, we uh, did a left uh, left eye lateral rectus resection of 10 mm and the medial rectus resection of 6 mm. Usually we would not operate on the affected eye, but here since the deviation was uh, very much and then there was a restriction of the lateral rectus, which might have probably developed because of the contracture, the long-standing contracture of the muscle. So we also did a LR, uh, right eye left uh, lateral rectus res uh, uh, recession of 10 mm and the inferior rectus recession. Of 6 millimeters. Okay. So our idea was, our goal was to attain uh, uh, orthotropia in the primary position. So this is what the <clears throat> first post of picture. Uh, and then next, yeah, here you can see the pre-op uh, presentation was uh, such a huge deviation. After the fixation during uh, surgery in the left eye, and right eye LR region combined with IR region, we attained, we achieved this uh, a good uh, orthotropia, orthotropia and uh, in primary position. Fantastic result. Yeah, another thing is uh, uh, such a long duration. Generally, we don't expect uh, this result. But uh, anyway, the patient was uh, very encouraging and he had the psychosocial trauma. In fact, uh, he, he was not married, in fact, because of this psychosocial uh, trauma. So... He landed in our hospital and we made an attempt. Uh, and in case of inverse duans, the the treatment is, you know, operating on the other eye so that the fixation we leave it for fixation duties. And here the advantage is ketosis also has improved. You can notice that. So we don't want to. We don't uh, need any ketosis uh, surgery here. By strabismus surgery itself. Uh, uh, we can get rid of the ptosis because it is purely, uh, predominantly it is a pseudotosis. There is no true tosis component actually. Generally, we expect sometimes, you know, pseudotosis and true tosis components together. But here, uh, predominantly it is a pseudotosis. So, uh, easily uh, with the fixation duress and the surgery on the other eye and the same eye, you could achieve this uh, result. Dr. Dakta, Dr. Dash, Dr. Maud, you can make a final comment or add something which can help out students and better understanding. Any treatment modalities? Uh, can... yeah. Devika, any more uh, treatment modalities? Can tell? So if it's uh, just a third cranial nerve involvement where there is uh, no... Um, uh, aberrant regeneration present, then we can, and with a good, uh, with some amount of medial rectus action, we can go for a supramaximal recession resection of the affected IS. Tell me the amounts, no? What is the amount of uh, lateral rectus resection and medial rectus resection? See, it is from 12 to uh, 18 millimeters of LR resection. 14 to 18 millimeters of LR resection combined with uh, uh, 8 to 10 millimeters of MR resection. Okay, that is one option. If at all, there is no inverse reacts. Okay. Another thing is uh, transposition of what? the transposition. Yes, exactly. Transposition. Okay. If, if here, no, if here, here FDT is positive, isn't it? So yes. That's why we didn't uh, FDT positive and inverse reacts is there. No. So we didn't uh, think of going for a transposition. Otherwise, it's such a huge deviation. Generally, we plan, for, plan to do LR uh, split. And then uh, transposition to the medial rectus muscle. I mean, LR, split LR is transposed to medial rectus muscle with faster augmentation. That is uh, uh, one modality. Uh, if all these won't, uh, don't work, then probably we go for even LR uh, uh, 
uh, fixation to the lateral wall of the orbit. That is one more option. Uh, these are all for uh, rehabilitation purpose. And sometimes uh, globe uh, fixation to the medial wall of the orbit. These are the other options. But fortunately, we attained, uh, we achieved this result. And uh, hope uh, this orthotropia continues. So we have to wait and see. And uh, Devika, last question. How is uh, his status now? What about diplopia? Has he got diplopia after this? I right. inquired about it. Yeah, there is no diplopia. In fact, on worth for dot test, we now see four dots, which is for the near vision that we checked, sir. And there is no diplopia. The patient is not complaining of diplopia as of now, sir. In all cases, so there is a very well presented case. Uh, since it is a PG series, I think we should more cover on the basic aspects of uh, TOSIS evaluation. So uh, I think we are short of time now. Yeah, madam, here one thing. So we can go ahead, Dr. Sita. We can have TOSIS, no, madam. Uh, I mean, pseudo TOSIS, no. That's why we didn't do much on TOSIS evaluation. But the first presenter, you can ask. Few more questions. Yes. So what are the basic, what are the causes of pseudotosis? So I would be just asking the basic questions which are asked yeah. in exam. Why here there is pseudotosis? Devika. Yes. Why there is pseudotosis in this case and what are the other causes of pseudotosis? Pseudotosis. This is a simple examination question. Yes. Okay. So, so what has happened is you have prepared this case, like yes. you have prepared only this case. There is but we should... can take up this question. I think both of them can take up the question. Yeah, yeah. Even Aishwarya Dr. Aishwarya, you can also answer. See, here there is hypotropia, isn't it? So in hypotropia, what it's happens to the... Pseudotosis and other take up pseudoproptosis. So, uh... Pseudotosis can also be because of the other eye being... Uh... Uh, if there is a retraction, uh, if we see of the other eye is one cause could be a pseudotosis for the other eye. Or if in case of hypotropia that we see uh, pseudotosis in this case, ma'am. See here, what happens you know, in hypotropia, the lid, you know, lid follows the conformity of the globe. Since it is hypotropic globe, it's following. As soon as you are doing cover test, see, eyeball is fixing. No, Whenever eyeball is coming to the fixing position, automatically the tosis is disappearing. Almost 99% it is disappearing. That is most frequent cause. And other causes you tell what happens in microphthalmos and then uh, a rudimentary eyeball or... Uh, so in a cases where... Or a uh, small eye of uh, microphthalmos. Or, yeah. So uh, that eye will be seen or because of the retraction of the eyelid of the other eye, this eye would appear as there is ptosis in the... There is pseudotosis. In ophthalmos. In ophthalmos. Yeah, yeah. In ophthalmos, yes. And uh, Dr. Aishwarya, uh, could you yes, take sir. up pseudoproptosis? Causes of pseudoproptosis. Since we are discussing pseudotosis, so this is you know, the common question that we asked in exams. This is out of syllabus for this uh, webinar, but uh, it is a common question. Pseudoproptosis again, if there is an, an ophthalmos, I so it could be the Pseudo other eye. Common cause, most common, common cause, 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 cause of pseudoproptosis. And then, how do you differ? What is the difference between blepharocalysis and dermatocalysis? Dermatocalysis uh, is due to the uh, skin, uh, due to the um, skin which is overhanging the loosened skin which is overhanging the upper lid margin. Whereas blepharocalysis uh, is a brutosis. So uh, uh, due to the recurrent uh, attacks of um, edema in the upper lid, the upper lid skin gets uh, stretched oh, and loosened because of which there is a uh, false impression of ptosis. So in exam, whenever um, postgraduates are given uh, a ptosis case, I think they should know the basic evaluation, a complete ptosis evaluation. So what is the importance of LPS? How do you calculate margin reflex distance? 
what is the significance of MRD 1, 2, and 3? Then uh, lead crease, what is the importance? So these are the basic questions which are asked in your viva. So uh, that and also the anatomy of the lead, all the layers. Uh, Dr. Aishwarya, can you tell me about the layers of eye leads? Yes, ma'am. So from outside to inside, uh, we have skin, then uh, muscles of protraction, then uh, orbital septum, uh, uh, the orbital fat, then uh, muscles of retraction, tarsus, and conjunctiva. What is, uh, Dr. Devika, what is the significance of uh, Bell's phenomena in the case of tosis? Um, Bell's phenomena, it will uh, decide if, uh, if the Bell's phenomena for the management of tosis, ma'am. Uh, for the surgical management of tosis is when we will check for whether there is a good fair or a poor bell's phenomena to tell for the post-surgical lag of thalmos that uh, uh, could be uh, there. So we have to manage our, uh, plan our management accordingly. Yes, right. And uh, what about corneal sensations? Do you need to check corneal sensations in all cases? Yes, ma'am, definitely. It's quite as important. All four quadrants, especially because if there is a decrease in corneal, corneal sensation and there is exposure keratitis for, uh, following surgery, then they would, uh, the sequelae of it will follow. And uh, just correcting the tosis is not how we have to manage. We have to see if uh, if the patient cannot perceive the sensation, then dry and following sequelae would develop. So sensation in all four quadrants uh, should be checked. When a child comes to you with a refractive error with the squint and a tosis, what would be the order of your management? What would you correct first? What would be the order of management? Ma'am, uh, first... Or a young adult. Or a young adult. Yes. Maybe 23-year-old. A 23-year-old young adult comes to you with a refractive error, a coexisting squint and a tosis. What would be the order of management? Ma'am, of course... Ma we okay. We'll first correct the refractive error. Uh, if the patient has vertical strabismus, then the vertical strabismus surgery will be planned first, then the tosis surgery. But if the patient has horizontal strabismus, we can go ahead with the uh, strabismus and tosis surgery simultaneously. Mom, first and foremost thing, we should look for the refractive correction and amblyopia, if any, because of the tosis that has developed in the 23-year-old is one thing we need to first see. Because if there is amblyopia, we, uh, it is very late. To, uh, you cannot do anything for the amblyopia, but that has to be checked for, for sure. And then accordingly, first preferred would be the management of the squint following the, uh, the tosis surgery. Or it might be, we could also think of a monoocular elevation deficit if uh, if it uh, if there is ele uh, elevation deficit is there and if there is tosis with it. Attractive error and then a squint and then the tosis. Yes. Dr. Datta. Uh, so I would really uh, recommend uh, uh, Dr. Raman on the outcome uh, in the patient with the third nerve palsy. Generally, third nerve palsies do not uh, get such wonderful alignment. Thank so you. Very I much. must really, really recommend your surgical skills and uh, management. And uh, this was an exceptional case. Generally, third now, uh, if you are able to get the eye in primary, that is more than enough. And uh, most people do not let the other eye to be touched. Most people would like just uh -huh. run at the suggestion of uh, touching the other eye. And uh, another thing is, uh, I would uh, want you to uh, rename your diagnosis, final diagnosis as a partially recovered post-traumatic yeah, third nerve palsy yeah. with hepatic regeneration. So that would uh, make the diagnosis more clear. Sure. Sure. Exactly, we don't know, madam. I, initially, how much was the deviation? Maybe, maybe some recovery might have happened. Uh, yeah. Because we don't have any pictures at that time when he was sick. Only childhood pictures are available and adulthood pictures. But uh, just before, after uh, that injury, recovery from that, uh, we don't have any pictures. At least we can account for that. Yes, sir, the fact that the eye was able to adapt. Yes, ma'am. We can. The, 
the right eye could at least adapt. So that means there was some kind of recovery, some amount. Yes. So that's why it is. Any more questions? Okay. So I think uh, we have done had wonderful cases, uh, very well presented, both of you, Dr. Devika and Dr. Aishwarya. I think all of us as examiners, as well as teachers, would give a big round of applause to all these two young girls who yeah. had the guts to come online, be with us. I probably at your age, I might have run away from this particular show only rather than come. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank I for this opportunity and sir and uh, my mentor, Dr. Raman, for guiding me, sir. Very, very, very well said. So I'm really happy and very proud of you two girls and the next generation next of uh, ophthalmologists, which we are going to have their confidence. We really laud you, we laud your efforts as well as your confidence. And of course, the proud mentors need no more mention, Dr. Smiya Mahot and uh, Dr. Raman. Thank you for mentoring your kids so mm -hmm. well. And uh, up Hello. their morale and for confidence to uh, be with us. And my sincere most thanks also to Dr. Datta and Dr. Das for being with us and being a kind examiner to both of them. You really took these ch uh, children across through while teaching, especially Dr. Raman and uh, Smita. You really gelled with them and, uh, you know, where you were acting like an internal and trying to help them out and bring them close and wonderful. So that is what we want, basically. So uh, thank you once more. I hope students, this must have been a great learning for you, how you should answer. Remember the, the way Dr. Smita told Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Das and Dr. Datta said, your case might be one particular, but the external might deviate away catching the words, whatever you utter during your exams. Mm -hmm. So pseudoproptosis, it might go to pseudotosis and everything like this. So you should prepare your case in and around whatever words you are going to utter during that ca uh, case or something allied to it. Then only your case presentation becomes. So this is the reason why precisely we have got this online platform for you people so that you learn from each other what exactly goes on in the mind of examiners like Raman, Dr. Smita, Dr. Datta and Dr. Das. So now I hope you would be knowing better when you come next time or when uh, during your any of the exams. So thank you once more all the examiners, all the mentors and all the mentees for a wonderful uh, case presentation. And uh, so we will be meeting again on next Wednesday, so, uh, students, at the same time. That time it would be the Journal Club. So till then, it's time for us to say bye-bye. And once more, heartfelt thanks to all of your seniors. Thank you. Thank you.